Welcome back, doctor. And we are here for the second part of uh, rotation correction uh, efficiently as you can in the treatment. So in the previous half of the seminar, we talked about um, how to fix some crowding and how to fix a severe rotation of a bicuspid. Now we're gonna talk about uh, what to do with cuspids. And this is not meant to talk about how to retrieve an impacted cuspid. This is to discuss what to do once you get some enamel in the arch and presuming the cuspid is rotated, which many of them are, uh, then you have to derotate it. And as I mentioned yesterday, cuspids have a really, really giant root surface area. It's uh, 0.75 square centimeters compared to like a lateral incisor, which is 0.40 square centimeters. So it's extremely difficult to move that cuspid and it can affect the anchorage on the adjacent teeth pretty severely at times. So um, with that, let's go to work on our uh, presentation here. So we'll go back to the same presentation we were on yesterday, which was uh, efficiency in rotating teeth. And that was here. Let me start this one. And now <clears throat> you saw the rotated teeth and a blocked out tooth. Now let's go to cuspid retrieval and rotation. So we'll go right to that slide. And this is where we left off. So we get to meet this young lady and uh, very nice patient, very nice family. The mom, dad have three kids and I did the ortho on all three of the kids and then the mom too. And this young lady was unfortunate uh, to have an impacted cuspid. So first we prepare the site to receive the cuspid as always. So that takes a couple of months to get it set up. And when I say set up, you're gonna pack coil between the four and the two to open the space to about nine or 10 millimeters to make sure you have plenty of room. And then I like to use a 016 night eye and put stainless steel open coil on there, just leave the passive open coil on it, then send it to the oral surgeon for attachment. And when you send it there, they will um, use a gold chain to retrieve it, no matter what you tell them or ask them, uh, that's how they were trained. So that's what they do. They use a gold chain. I would rather use a Kobayashi hook uh, wire on a button, but either way, it doesn't make any difference. So what I do, when I get it back from the surgeon, I cut off all the gold links that are hanging out of the tissue, except the very last one. So there's one gold link hanging out in the oral cavity. Then you pass a ligature tie through that gold link, and then you tie that ligature tie to the arch wire. And then you monthly deflect the night tie wire uh, two to three millimeters until the cuspid comes in. So in this case, uh, you know, high probability of success. The patient's pretty young. Let's see, do I have an age on there? No, I think she's about 13 at the time. So Sooner or later, the cuspid comes in and you can see this big giant piece of composite that the oral surgeon had placed on there. And you know, during that surgery, you can't really tell where you are on the tooth, um, meaning buccal lingual or whatever. So they just do the best they can. So now it's actually in the arch and now I'm, you can see it's rotated about 90 degrees. So you can get a bracket on there. Well, you can get something or a button or a bracket. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna use your imagination. So it took about four months to bring that cuspid down. That's pretty good. So I've got uh, the setup, what I thought was a good idea. And I put stainless steel wire in the slots. And then I had this 012 night tie behind the tooth, thinking that that was gonna shoot this out like a slingshot would do. Then I have a separate piece of chain from the buckle, uh, from this, excuse me, the mesial surface, this bracket on the mesial, all the way up here to the centrals. Remember the longer the chain is, the better it is from yesterday docs. And then another piece of chain going from the four up to the two, and again, acting like a slingshot to push it out. So I'm trying to rotate it and push it out at the same time. The coil is holding the space open for me. Okay, so we'll see what that looks like here in a minute. So I've got a sling um, type of thing, like the slingshot, if you will, uh, behind there. And I asked the question, is that good or is that dumb? And later I found out that that was really dumb because I had it tied in so tightly underneath the main wire, the 16 steel, that there was no uh, flexibility in the wire anymore. It was just stuck right there in the slot. So that did absolutely nothing. So if you're gonna use something like that, you have to allow it to slide in the slots. So a simple night tie um, in the, excuse me, in the brackets and then tied behind here probably would have been a better idea and just put open stainless steel coil to hold the spot. Okay, so there's a chain from the three to the two for rotation and labial movement and then a chain from one, two, three to four as like a slingshot again to shoot this thing out into the arch. And then we can get a bracket on that surface eventually. And 
I forgot to remove the blob of composite right there because I was so interested in getting the thing rotated and spun uh, that I forgot to take that off. So that's going to prove to be uh, actually kind of a good thing because the patient comes back early and that little sharp edge was irritating her lip as the tooth moved. Then it poked, starts poking into her lip and now we get to change the chain. And I alluded to that yesterday and I said, you know, chain only lasts about two weeks before it runs out of energy, but we don't bring them back in two weeks. We just do everything on a 30 day basis. And I know uh, McGann likes to talk about an eight to 10 week interval, but I like, and I prefer you to see our patients every four weeks, every month, unless it's a headgear or something like that, because I want to make sure we're making progress in the case. Okay. So, but she comes back because that little piece of composite was protruding. And remember the longer the chain is, the more efficient it is. That's why it's up to the central. And you can see it goes back to the four right there. So she comes back in two weeks and we have take the opportunity to grind the composite off because that was irritating her. And she was very happy about that. And then we got to change the chain at the same time to continue the, the activation. And I just went ahead and cut the night tie out of there because it was doing absolutely nothing. And that was a dumb move on my part. And here we are 14.5. And you can see the chain is not very tight right there. Um, my colleague, Dr. Yano in the practice was doing this for me because I was gone teaching someplace. So he put a button on there, which was really smart. Uh, don't waste a bracket yet on there because you can't get the bracket at the right position. And then he put a chain to uh, spin this side and another one on this side. So now he's got a force couple in there, which was super smart to do. And there's the force couple for you docs. So one chain pulling back like that and one chain pulling forward to cause the thing to spin because the labial is right here. So this was very efficient. Uh, unfortunately, again, she came back in two weeks with my regular appointment. And now I got to change the chains into something that were super tight. You can see this chain is uh, very, very passive. It's almost non, non active because it's got an extra hole in there. So then I'm going to change it to super chain. I'm going to make it like super tight and how tight, uh, right before it breaks. That's how tight. <clears throat> and again, remember the longer it is, the better. So it goes from the button all the way back to the hook on the molar. That's a nice long chain. That's good. And again, all the way from the, the bracket you have here up to the central, maybe across to the contralateral side central. So again, the longer the chain, the better it is. That's good. Don't worry about this cross central incisor problem here. You have to go back to night high at some point to fix the rotation here. So we'll fix this stuff. Then the main emphasis now is to get that cuspid in and rotated. So you can see how tight that chain is one more hole and the chain probably would be broken. So that's a nice way to go. So now you'll see a lot of action from that. And in 30 days, in 30 days, the rotation has been completed, which is what you want to see. But hey, you can't get the bracket on there in the right position. So throw the night tie over the top of the button. Notice there's no tie at all on here, nothing on here. So you can just loop it over the top of that, tie that in here. And now the, the cuspid will shoot into the arch because extrusion is very easy compared to intrusion. And if you needed more deflection, remember that trick from my nephew yesterday, we can go under the tie wings here over the button here and back under the tie wings here and then back in the central and that'll get that in super fast. But even as it is, it's going to come in super fast at 30 days later, you've got plenty of enamel. Sorry about the terrible picture, but <clears throat> now you can put the bracket on at the right height, 4.5 millimeters and the wire is an 18 night type. You could easily use a 14 or a 16. It wouldn't make any difference. So now you're going to complete all the rotations everywhere in the whole arch and then just go on your merry way. So you told her probably two plus years. So that means it's nice. You've got uh, another 10 months to work on it. And I always quote the impacted cuspid cases long, you know, tell them like 28 to 34 months because you know how long it's going to take the cuspid to come down. My record for one cuspid on an adult, 53 months. So <laughs> Uh, that wasn't a very big money maker, and nor was it, uh, he was kind of tired of me and I was kind of tired of him, but at least we got the cuspid in. So that was all good. Okay. So there you go. Another 90 degree spin in three months and keep in mind on that giant tooth. Now that's, that's something to be, um, 
impressed with ducks. So you saw a bicuspid spin, but a bicuspid, especially an upper second by, you know, just has a conical root with not a very big root surface area compared to that, <coughs> excuse me, compared to that cuspid. So that's why this is a, a pretty important thing, pretty impressive. So uh, now I want to look at a different case. And instead of just showing you the shorty slides, I'm going to show you that whole case. And I know this might make us run a little bit long, but it's got a lot of interesting details in that case. So I want to start this one and then see if hopefully you're on the same share with me. Let me watch this and make sure because I don't want to have that a mistake. Uh, good. So it opens smoothly into this PowerPoint. So we're all good. Now we'll start the case. So we get to meet Ilana and she's 14 when she transfers to our office. And this was a second opinion. Um, it was about the retrieval of a impacted cuspid after serial extraction of bicuspids. And this poor girl had already been in treatment probably for five years. And um, well, you'll read the rest of that story here in just a minute. But she went to, the mom took her to one of those uh, chain clinic things. And, you know, every time she went in there, she saw a different orthodontist. So I'm sorry, it was four years, not five years. And, you know, there's no continuity in treatment and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a difficult thing. And somebody, you can tell by the X's on the bicuspids there, somebody had planned on taking out the first bicuspids. So let's look at the case and see what you think. And we look here at the lower crowding, which is, you know, like maybe three, four millimeters and the upper crowding, that's no big deal. And on a African-American girl, the protrusion is not a problem. Let's go look here at the CEF. And somebody decided to do a serial extraction and the patient is scale class one, normal protrusion for African-American. So this shouldn't have bothered you too much. And let's see what the classification is here. Oh, isn't that nice? We were pretty darn close to a class one if we could get the cuspids in, but that's the problem is the upper cuspids. So not that I agree with the treatment plan. I, I think it could have probably been done non-extraction, but oh my gosh, in ortho for four years, and now they're talking about removal of the impacted canine and then making a bridge later for it. So the mom was a patient of, of the office anyway. So she wanted a second opinion about this and that's where we come in. So now you get to see the picture and we were able to retrieve the initial panorex and you can see it's way way back there before the bicuspid extraction and this bracket right here was placed incorrectly it was forcing the root of that tooth into the path of that cuspid and every single one of you pos students have heard from all of us talking about that don't bracket the cuspid the lateral until the cuspid is halfway sorry one fourth of the way down the root and that's what shock says is half the way uh, the real POS stance on that is one fourth the way down the route. And the Jeff Taylor version is past the forming apex. Okay. Past the forming apex. And if you think you have to bracket, if you think you have to bracket, then you will bracket like this, leaving the root pointing to the mesial. Remember, this is a phase one treatment. This is not phase two. So in this way, uh, potentially we could, you know, protect that lateral root. But in, in this case, I'm sorry, in this case, this lateral is going to be lost. And the thing that's really sad is somebody took the picture, somebody saw this, and nobody did anything about it. It was just left just like this. Had they changed the bracket now and put the root way to the mesial, you might have avoided the impaction and you might have saved the root of that tooth too. So um, <clears throat> you can see what's happening here. Uh, overlapping of the cuspid and lateral root with the bracket on top of it like that. And normally you don't get problems if the apex is formed, but in a young patient, it's not fully formed yet. So that's one of the issues here. And so there's the, there's the real rule, one fourth of the way down the two, the rat, one fourth of the way down the lateral root. So you might want to take a picture of that, despite what all of my colleagues say, some say one third, some say one half, you know, everybody has to have their own thing to be unique. So my thing is past the forming apex. Okay. So that's the rule. And now here we are, uh, how many months later? Looks like seven months later. Yeah, seven months later. And the bicuspids were extracted. And again, nobody did anything about the lateral incisor. And now you've got plenty of room, 
but that's another POS rule. When you have an impacted cuspid, excuse me, an impacted cuspid, you do not remove the bicuspid until you confirm that the cuspid is moving. So you see how courageous this would be. What if you can't go get the cuspid? Now you could just use the four and take out the three and you could have a full complement of teeth or I should say all 24 teeth. So that's another violation of at least POS rules. Another year goes by and again, nobody did anything for a whole year with that lateral root. So, so sad it's being destroyed by that cuspid. The other one's coming down there nicely and we change the angulation on this uh, right side lateral to make that up right now that the cuspid is in. But again, it's totally iatrogenic, the destruction of that lateral. So please docs, don't make that mistake. You will feel terrible, okay? And it's been almost two years since the buys were extracted. So we don't know how many total months of treatment this is, but you know, when you got her, it was four years into treatment. And here's the surgeon, or I should say the orthodontist, somebody over there was trying to bring in that cuspid and they use this really old, old thing called a TMS pin. And most of you in the audience, um, if you're watching this, you're probably not old enough to remember what that was by, by whale dent. And it was called a TMS pin. And it was like a little mini, mini eyelet that you would get from Home Depot. And they didn't have good composite bonding back there. So what they would do is drill a hole through the enamel into dentin and then use a one millimeter twist drill to drill into the dentin. And you just, you know, keeping your fingers crossed that you weren't going to hit the pulp. Then you screw this eyelid in there. And then that gave you a secure method to bring the uh, cuspid in. So you could see the, the chain on there, the, the uh, ligature tie, whatever he was using. And then that ligature tie broke. So you can see the TMS pin in there. Now that's the radio opaque thing, this long-ish item right through here. And you really don't know where you are in there. So now the guys kind of threw up his hands and said, well, let's go just get it extracted and we'll make a bridge later. And of course, that doesn't sound like such a great idea to the mom and the parent. And there's the broken retrieval wire and the TMS pin in the tooth. And now let's see what we have. So you see it made a little bit of change in the profile. Uh, the lower incisor is slightly more upright and the upper is just about the same as it was. So this is when you get her and doctors, if you're ever thinking of doing something like this, you take all new records with the rec with the appliance on so that you can record exactly what she was when you inherited the case. Okay? So don't strip the appliance off yet. Leave it all on and take new records. Okay? And that's what happened uh, between the age of 10 and between the age of, I think, 14 right there. That was her growth because that's a very, very active growth time for the female. You know, her peak growth spurt is 11.5 years. So she was right in the thick of it uh, during this whole ortho time. So again, the, the start versus the final, where, where did the teeth go? Lower incisor went back a little bit and the rest of the molars went forward quite a bit. Okay. And now we're going to do the reattachment surgery. And the comment in the chart was there was composite all over the place where he tried to bond composite on the, the cuspid, but it didn't stick. So. The problem was the resorption of the lateral root. Once you could see in there, when you had a big flap laid out, there was no root left on the lateral, which you'll see here in just a moment. Okay. So 016 Nitai deflected to the upper three, and you might as well try and bring that in because the two is going to be lost. So we should have the three, otherwise it's going to be a, a really big bridge today. Of course, it would be implants, but in those days it was bridge work. Okay. And the rest of the case is pretty easy. You know, this cuspid came in and it's pretty close to class one. And here, all we have to do is bring that in and it'll be class one to the lower. So it looks pretty easy, but look at the lateral root. So docs, doctor, excuse me, doctor, the, this is the apex of that lateral right there. So the tooth is completely shot. And you know, once it's exposed to the oral cavity like that, there's no way you're gonna get attachment back on there, much less bone to grow on top of that. So it's a loser, okay? And we're going to leave it in there for whatever attachment it has and use it for anchorage to bring in the cuspid, but we know that it will be lost. All right. So we'll just press on with that. And you can see um, canine retrieval mechanics. Again, I just not to discuss this, but uh, you allow movement of the lateral incisor by not putting rectangular wire in the slot. And that's the piggyback theory. Um, I don't use piggybacks unless it's absolutely positively necessary. 
because I want the teeth to have all the freedom that they need to come in. So a steel wire in there controls the roots more carefully. Night tie wire will allow the roots to do whatever they want to do. And that's why it's better just to do it on round night tie. And you know, if a cuspid is moving up, then that puts the wire like this, which makes the roots go opposite the cuspid, opposite the cuspid like that. So um, that's why it's a good thing to do it just with round night tie. So the canine is going to be retrieved and not extracted because it has a poor prognosis with the lateral, which is actually a loser. So we're just going to leave it there and use it for a while. So there you see the lateral is moving excessively because uh, it doesn't have any bone support. And we got all the way up in rectangular in the lower. It's just sitting there waiting for the upper. Uh, and here comes the head of the TMS pin, that kind of a gold color item right there. So we just have a little bit more to go, and then we're going to get some enamel in there. And again, there's the apex of that tooth, so that's a loser. And reactivate the night tie to keep bringing that in. So we have a little bit more coming in. And we should be seeing some enamel pretty quick. And it doesn't look like much is happening here. Uh, so now we get some enamel in the arch. And then you can see where that TMS pin was right here it looks like it was uh cut off so we'll wait and see where it is and let's see what happens for this poor girl there we got a button on some surface so remember you want to pull as much enamel as you can into the arch and then put as many things as you can on it to derotate it if it's rotated so we don't know yet but uh, now we can see the tms pin was put right in the lingual right where that little teeny pulp horn is and you know docs and a pulp horn in cuspids can be like the lingual here and then the big one on the front, but sometimes it's a pretty pronounced one right there. So if that pin went right down into that pulp chamber, then that's going to be a problem in the future. So you can see the pin and you just grab it and unscrew it with the little wrench that they provide. And of all the luck, the thing comes in with the lingual on the buckle. So she's rotated again. Um, like 180 degrees and the poor kid's been in ortho for so long and now you've got to spin that tooth so it'd be nice if we could do it efficiently okay. so the button is added to help derotate and put another button on the other surface to help rotate the tooth so took out the pin put a button on top of that and as we talked about a minute ago it's better to pull the tooth all the way down in the arch and then um, add more things on it to, de to derotate it so again, force couple could be used. And you can see this uh, could have been made more efficient. We have a chain buckle going back to the molar hook. We could have put one more from here going up to the incisors like that. But you know, hindsight's perfect. You can't always think of everything at the chair in a busy day. So just do the best you can with that. And it's working, but it's not working too fast. And again, because it's such a giant tooth, just like on our last little patient. So now we've got a combination uh, to rotate the tooth. And again, better than better than nothing. Now we'll stick another thing on there called an eyelet, same thing as a button, and it'll give us a chance to deflect the night tie some more. Again, it'll put more enamel into the arch so that you can put more things on there so you can derotate it more efficiently. So you've got three attachments on this one, one on the buckle, one on the distal, and one on the lingual. It's kind of hard to see where you are in that picture, but that's where you're supposed to be. And you see some chain on there as well. That's the only rotating force and change every month, okay? And now, we get another chain placed on there to help that thing spin that goes back to the molar. And it's a tough tooth to rotate. And you can see the bite opening from all these forces on that cuspid. And again, because it's such a big, giant, powerful tooth, but we'll straighten it out on stainless steel. Don't worry about that. And now you get a button on actually, I mean, a bracket on the labial surface. So once you can get the wire deflected into that, you should probably be pretty successful at getting it spun. Okay. So again, it could have been more efficient by adding a chain from the lingual surface up to the labials, I mean, to the labial of these centrals and stuff 
to cause that thing to spin more efficiently, but we weren't as good then as we are now. So now once you get a bracket on there and you get a night tie through it, <coughs> excuse me, it'll probably derotate pretty well. All right. And there's the scar from the TMS pin. And you can see it's right in that pulp horn. And looks like the wrong bracket, but that doesn't matter. You could use any bracket. It would get the job done for right now to derotate it. So poor kid now in braces for six years. And um, it's easier, like I said, just put the wire over the gingival tie wings, or if you had the button like our previous case, and that'll get it in the arch really fast. Bending a piece of night tie like that is kind of a joke. So there's no reason to do that. Just hook it over the tie wings, and then we'll change the bracket later. Good. And now some more derotation efforts. That's good. Of course, the patient is anxious to get out of here. So we're trying to walk the midline over because there's space in the upper left quad. So we can use that to walk the midline. And there's the space and we get to pull, pull, pull. And one tooth at a time and then go get the opposite central. Usually adults won't let you do that. It won't let you make a midline diastema like that. But usually kids don't care too much. But adults will make you take both centrals at the same time. Once you get that solved, and again, it should change that bracket. That's a that's actually a 1-3 on a 2-3, but it's an old system where we didn't even have ball hooks. This was an old bracket from Ormco. And there we go, looking better. And it would be good if it was, I mean, except for that lateral incisor that's completely shot. And Docs, if you're ever thinking of transfer a case like this, uh, I want you to strip all that whole appliance off and put your own appliance on there. The one that you know and that you're used to working with and so on and so forth. I know it's tempting just to keep trying with the old one, but you don't know anything about it or the torque or anything else. So you're far better off to change the appliance. And again, that's just part of the cost that the patient will have to bear. So she's in a hurry to get done, of course. And you're thinking, ah, we don't need to do such a great job of these uh, cuspid position because we're going to put a bridge on here. We didn't have implants then. But again, that's that's the wrong thinking. You should be trying to make it to be as nice as it can be for the bridge. So um, it ended up needing a graft on the buccal surface. So we did that. Uh, looks like a maybe a pallet donor site. And you can see the, the position of the root wasn't great. But again, we had the wrong bracket on there. Um, and we never got to rectangular wire or anything else. And we didn't even have heat wire then. And we know the lateral, even though the lateral looks good, it's going to be lost on that side. Okay. So happy patient, happy to get done. And bless her heart, she's pretty good spirit all the way through this whole thing. But uh, I can imagine six years of ortho, she'd be pretty happy. So the Panorex, and again, you can see the lateral root is completely shot. And that was a totally iatrogenic, whoever messed that up. And the cuspid doesn't have a very good root angulation, or nor does it have proper torque. But you know, the, it was limited by time constraint. Okay. And start final. Not much movement here because, you know, the teeth were already extracted and the spaces were pretty much closed. So there was nothing exciting there, but she still had, oh, well, that's age 10 to 16. So six years of treatment, she had quite a bit of growth and the overlays, same as it was before. So here, three years later, uh, there's the bridge in place for the missing lateral. And what happens during uh, this procedure, anytime you prep a tooth, as you know, it's trauma to the tooth and to the pulp. So the cuspid already underwent trauma when it was retrieved by having a TMS pin insulting the pulp. And then the retrieval effort could possibly insult the pulp. And then you prep it to insult the pulp. And when a pulp gets in, it gets you know abused too many times, you know what happens, the nerve dies. So you get to see uh, what happens then. So a pretty nice bridge, but again, it could have been better uh, with the implant, I'm sorry, better with the cuspid had it been placed in the right position. So, but a, an acceptable result. And sorry for the blurry picture, but that's three years post. And six years post, there's the endo from the trauma on the cuspid. So the poor kid underwent all that. Now it has to have a root canal on the cuspid. 
So that's a bad thing, but just go right through the bridge and do that. And that's the end. So I hope that was um, helpful for you docs as far as rotating teeth. And uh, again, from yesterday, I want you to be as efficient as you possibly can when you do this, because the faster you get through night tide, the more time you have in mechanics and so on and so forth. So we learned some valuable lessons with that last case. And don't extract the bicuspid until you're sure that the cuspid is moving. And number two, when you're going to bracket that upper lateral, make sure that the cuspid is one fourth of the way down the root or more than that. And if you have to do it, if you have to bracket the lateral incisor, then you know early in treatment for whatever reason, I want you to make the roots stay to the mesial because that's the way they are uh, preoperatively anyway, where the cuspid is in that big trough right above it. So don't try and upright them, leave them that direction because you intentionally misbracket the lateral incisors. So those are two very good uh, things to take away from that case. All right, Doc, so uh, until we meet again, I want to thank you for watching and I hope again that was very helpful. So see you soon.